Well, <clears throat> I would, oh, oh, okay, all right. I guess you need to know who I am. <laughs> all right, well, I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this symposium because I cannot tell you how excited I am to be at a gathering where people are not just willing, but ready and excited to talk about the Indian Citizenship Act. So I will confess to you that I've had a mild obsession with the law ever since I wrote a paper about it about 20 to 25 years ago. I should have, 20 to 20, mm. uh, Since that time, I've only had the occasional chance to think about the ICA despite this mild obsession. Thus, I'm truly grateful for this opportunity to more fully turn my attention to it with this amazing group of curious-minded folks. This is a rare and amazing opportunity. But before we get too deep in our feelings and all lovey-dovey with each other, I should probably just come clean and admit that I'm also having an existential crisis about this whole endeavor. And despite my mild obsession, I am having some serious questions about what I am doing here and how, if at all, I can contribute. And since I'm the one currently at the podium, I guess you're just going to have to listen to me talk through my impromptu self-help therapy session about the Indian Citizenship Act. <laughs> So let's start over. I'm extremely thankful to be here. I'm happy to be with you all. I have no doubt that I will learn and maybe even have some of my questions answered and anxieties relieved. That being noted, this is also kind of where my problem starts. You see, I am just a simple country lawyer who originally hails from North Dakota. And sometimes when a bunch of intelligent folks such as yourself start talking about important things, I can get a little lost in all the highfalutin theory and $10 words. <laughs> Consequently, I tend to look at things plainly and simply from my limited perspective as a person who is curious about law and policy. And what is the plain and simple question that arises nowadays when I think about the Indian Citizenship Act from my limited perspective as a person who is curious about law and policy? Does citizenship matter? Now, in one sense, this is a fundamentally stupid question. Of course it matters. So, for example, while I am a citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians, it was my status as a citizen of the United States that allowed me access to the federal financial aid. And without that aid, I have no idea how I would have fed my sad and desperate addiction to college degrees. And I am obviously not the only Native person to benefit from financial aid or the GI Bill or countless other federal programs that are available to American citizens. So citizenship grants rights and access. And Native peoples, at least theoretically, although obviously not always in practice, have had those rights and access for about, for about 100 years now. So what is there to question? And this is where things get a little sticky for me. And it is the reason why I'm having an existential crisis right now before you. You see, the more I think about it, the more I'm left with the conclusion that it is pointless to think about citizenship without thinking about another part of federal Indian law. Plenary power. Now, this is obviously a very educated group, so I suspect that many of you are already aware of the doctrine of plenary power in federal Indian law. But I also hate it when presenters assume knowledge with an audience when they shouldn't. So I hope that you will forgive me if I'm a bit simplistic for some of you, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So with that caveat, let's jump into it. Plenary power is a doctrine of American law that is a prominent part of federal Indian law and also is a significant part of immigration law and, law and the law of the territories. And what is this doctrine of law? In essence, it is the federal government giving itself virtually limitless authority to legislate and regulate in these areas. In Indian law, it has been the legal justification for well over a century for the excessive exercise of force and coercion through efforts like boarding schools, allotment, reservations, termination, relocation, and numerous other laws and efforts with the aims of destroying tribal rights, land claims, and ways of life, while, also, while justifying federal claims and authority over tribal territories and resources. Now, this version of plenary power was articulated in the Supreme Court for the first time in an 1886 case called U.S. v. Kagama. As such, the first thing we should note then is that this case, which established the basic understanding of plenary power at the Supreme Court, was decided during what people like me tend to call the allotment era of federal policy. Now, unfortunately, we only have so much time for me to publicly work through my existential crisis so we won't get too deep into the policy eras in general or the allotment era in particular, 
other than to say that some smart folks who have preceded me in this field have identified different historical periods in which the federal government has tried to solve its so-called Indian problem, and that the allotment era, which I would say ran from about 1871 to 1934, is defined by the federal government's efforts to destroy tribal nations and tribalism. So it is in this period of destruction when plenary power gets its start. Now, Associate Justice Samuel Miller authored the, and by the way, he totally looks like a guy you really want to party with, right? <laughs> so Justice Samuel Miller authored the opinion, and he pretty succinctly summed up the origins of plenary power and the justification for it. Now, I'm not going to read this to you, okay, but I do want to highlight a couple of things. First, we see how native peoples are conceptualized in the law in the moment that plenary power is being adopted by the Supreme Court. They are obviously understood as a people who are lesser than. Second, we see the move from treaties to congressional legislation. Now, we're all well aware that in the, later, the later in history we get, the more likely Indian treaties involved a significant power imbalance, imbalance to the detriment of native peoples. But for whatever fault we might find with how certain treaties came to be, at least native voices were a part of the process. Now, as imagined is obvious, when the federal government shifted to legislation to address the Indian problem, these voices were missing to a certain, to a great extent. Thus, as plenary power was being adopted by the Supreme Court, it would come to help eradicate native resistance in an era where the federal government was seeking to destroy tribal nations and tribalism. So that's a bit about the when and the why about plenary power, but what about the what? How has the Supreme Court described plenary power? How has the court understood the scope of this doctrine? Well, we start to get an even better sense of this in another case from the allotment era, Lone Wolf v. Hitchcock. Now, Lone Wolf is, of course, a very famous case with some very famous quotes. But I want us to focus on this lesser known passage. We are told that tribal members who are not emancipated can be controlled by congressional legislation. Now, admittedly, this particular passage makes reference to tribal land specifically, and the case itself is about the abrogation of treaties. So if one was feeling particularly generous, or was especially naive, one could make the argument that, at least in this moment, there was some limitation to plenary power. Perhaps it only involved land and or treaties. However, the conceptual horse had escaped the barn during the allotment era. Thus, another case, this one from 1914, perhaps best encapsulates, encapsulates the frightening totality of the scope of the plenary power doctrine. As we see, Justice Willis Van Devanter makes reference to the full power of the United States. Furthermore, this full power could touch upon any and every aspect of a tribal nation and of a tribal individual. Under Van Devanter's description, it is hard to see if there is any limit to plenary power at all. Unless you think that all these cases are dusty relics of the past that are all older than the ICA that we are ostensibly here to talk about, let's look at a couple of cases from this century. Even more modern courts embrace a seemingly limitless federal plenary power over native peoples, although they do tend to use softer language nowadays. Furthermore, this understanding of plenary power is not limited to any particular political viewpoint we might imagine the justices having. Plenary power in Indian law, in which the federal government asserts essentially limitless authority over Native America, has transcended time and political persuasions and still lives with us today. Now, admittedly, there are other ways that the concept of plenary power can and has been parsed in federal Indian law. And if you want to get really nerdy about it, we can have a conversation on the matter sometime later. However, as I've noted before, I am a simple country lawyer, and I want to keep this as straightforward as possible for us. Thus, it is this long-standing, all-encompassing authority that the federal government has assumed over native peoples that I am referencing when I'm talking about plenary power. Whew, my goodness, even after this brief introduction, it is obvious that this plenary power doctrine is pretty important and should be understood by more people. I mean, you would think somebody would write a book about it or something. 
Well, luckily somebody has, and it will be available February of 2025 from Stanford University Press. It is really the kind of deep exploration of Indian law doctrine that will change your life. Okay, and furthermore, it is exquisitely written for a more general audience. So you should really do yourself a huge favor by assigning it to your classes, because you will not believe how amazing your discussions with your students will be. I promise that you will thank me later. And now that I've changed your life, let me get back to my existential crisis. Perhaps at this point in the presentation, you might be wondering what any of this has to do with the ICA and citizenship more generally. Perhaps you're asking if this goofball standing in front of you is going to make any sense, or is he just trying to sell a stupid book? <laughs> well, I am a little hurt by your snarky attitude, but I do think it's a mostly fair question that brings us back to my original question. Does citizenship matter? Let me put it another way. As I noted earlier, we tend to think of citizenship as granting rights or access within a political sphere. And in the United States and elsewhere, of course, we also tend to envision citizenship as preserving the distance between the individual and the government so that the individual will not suffer the intrusive and odious overreach of the government. Our citizenship is, among other things, supposed to protect us from the government. All of which is to suggest that this conception of citizenship in which the citizen has rights that the government must not violate, seems fundamentally at odds with the exercise of plenary power. These two things, it would seem, simply cannot coexist. The federal government cannot have full control over native peoples and lands, and yet be restrained by the citizenship of native peoples. These concepts would seem to be irreconcilably at odds with each other. And yet, Despite this obvious conflict, American law tries to claim both. It states both that Native peoples are American citizens and that it has plenary power over Native America. This is weird. <laughs> it kind of feels like the American government is arguing that two bodies, in fact, can occupy the same space at the same time. And even if we can wrap our heads around that idea, there is a natural follow-up question. What happens when these two understandings in the law are in conflict? If we concede that they can both be true, how does American citizenship hold up when pitted against plenary power? If they do, in fact, both exist under the law, which reigns supreme if the law has to choose one over the other? Now, on this question, American courts have been unequivocal. Plenary power is the clear winner. There are three Supreme Court cases from the late 19th and early 20th century that really cement the doctrine of plenary power in federal Indian law. We've already looked at two of them, Kagama and Lone Wolf. The third of these three cases, U.S. v. Sandoval, dealt directly with the conflict between plenary power and American citizenship for Native peoples. Decided in 1913, the crux of the issue in Sandoval revolved around whether a statute that prohibited bringing liquor into Indian country applied to Pueblo peoples. Now, since we have limited time, I'm going to oversimplify a bit. But if you want to know more, there's a really great book coming out soon. But in essence, this case was the first to see the seemingly competing understandings within American law that we have been tracing face off against each other. On one side, there was a law that prohibited liquor in Indian country, and which can be understood as an expression of federal plenary power. On the other side were the Pueblo, who, because of their colonial history, could have and perhaps should have been regarded as American citizens. So, which side won out? Well, this is a silly question to ask since I've already told you the answer. Anyway, Associate Justice Willis Van Devanter spent the bulk of his opinion describing the ostensibly savage nature of the Pueblo before, as you can see, concluding that whether they were citizens or not didn't matter because the federal government had plenary power over them. A further collisions between these two understandings in American law produced similar results. A couple of years before the ICA, the court was once again unequivocal that the federal government had plenary power, that Native peoples were wards, and that citizenship did not alter either of these statements of law. Almost 20 years after the ICA was passed, the court again brushed aside the citizenship of Native peoples in favor of plenary power. Thus, when the Supreme Court has had to choose 
It has always chosen plenary power over American citizenship, the American citizenship of Native peoples. And so I ask again, does citizenship matter? What protections does citizenship hold for Native peoples if we live under a legal regime in which the federal government holds full power over Native peoples? What rights can Native peoples ever hope to have respected if they can all be undermined by plenary power? Doesn't the very nature of plenary power render citizenship moot? So does citizenship even matter? And let's complicate the issue even further. As we all know, since we're sitting in this room, the Indian Citizenship Act was passed in 1924. As such, I'm pretty sure that most people in my line of work would concede that the Indian Citizenship Act was a product of the allotment era, the same era in which the plenary power doctrine was adopted by the Supreme Court. And as a reminder, the allotment era was characterized by the government's efforts to destroy tribal nations and tribalism. These are the circumstances under which the ICA was born. Now, to be fair, the legislation itself recognizes the multi-layered citizenship of Native peoples by explicitly noting that the legislation was not to impair the rights of Native individuals to their rights as tribal citizens. And many regarded the ICA as merely closing a loophole. As by the federal government's estimates, two-thirds of Native peoples were already acknowledged as American citizens through other means. So in one sense, it's a really small piece of legislation that doesn't do a whole lot. But in another sense, it is a further articulation of the goals of the allotment era, which again were to destroy tribal nations and tribalism. And one of the biggest reasons so many individuals were already considered citizens before the passage of the ICA was the Allotment Act itself and subsequent legislation which bequeathed American citizenship while also creating the conditions to dispossess tribal peoples and nations of their land. Consequently, it is hard to regard the American citizenship for Native peoples of this era as some sort of altruistic effort to raise Native individuals to an equal legal, political, and social status as that of their colonizing neighbors. Rather, it is difficult to regard it as anything other than another weapon in colonialism's ongoing and unyielding attempt to acquire the resources of indigenous people. This, it would appear, to be the loophole that the ICA was really seeking to close. As such, maybe the question we should be asking is not whether American citizenship matters, but whether American citizenship should matter to Native peoples when it was born of these circumstances. So after all of that, I hope you can now see why I'm having this existential crisis. How can we say that citizenship even matters when plenary power is hanging over our heads? Isn't citizenship hollow under our current legal regime? Furthermore, to what extent do we have to concede that American citizenship was and remains a tool to benefit the colonizer more than anything else? Does the burden of American citizenship and its consequences for tribal sovereignty, we might add, outweigh whatever benefits that I and other Native peoples may have accrued from it? Now let's get real honest with each other for a moment. Perhaps you think I am overreacting. Perhaps you might try to assuage my psyche by rightfully noting that we are in a different time with different attitudes about Native peoples than those of the allotment era. And maybe you even noted that most of the cases I've looked at where there's a conflict between citizenship and plenary power are around the same vintage of the ICA itself. Maybe you are inclined to suggest that we've moved past the bad old days and can never go back. To which I respond, I hope you're right but I am not assuaged. The history of federal Indian law and policy suggests that we move back and forth between gains and losses. And since we've been in a relatively good period for Native America for a while, it's not hard to see what might be right around the corner. And in fact, you don't have to look very hard in the United States right now to find folks who want to turn back the clock, whether in Indian country or elsewhere. So how do we address this issue? Does citizenship even matter when plenary power clearly trumps it in American law? Is there anything we can do about the overarching specter that is plenary power 
which has the potential to neuter whatever citizenship may provide. Well, you're going to have to read Chapter 5 to find out. Thank you so much.